And it is episode 151 of Being Bookish. Yeah, the format is going to be slightly different again, but this week I'm doing a sort of crossover with Lorraine from Once Upon a Nightmare as we are doing the book and the film in separate episodes. So you want to find out what happened in the film? Listen to hers. You want to find out what didn't happen in the book because we are not going to be spoiling it. (laughs) You can listen to mine. This week we are talking about a 1938 science fiction novella titled Who Goes There? It was originally published under the name Don A. Stewart, but the author was John W. Campbell Jr., who was writing from 1937 right up until 1971 when he passed away. You may well be more familiar with it under the title The Thing From Another World or The Thing, the 1982 film by John Carpenter. Anyway, we are talking the book, and I'm going to give a very, very brief summary, and then Lorraine and I are going to get into it. Hey, Lorraine. A remote scientific research expedition at the North Pole is invaded by a monstrous alien, reawakened after lying frozen for centuries after a crash landing. The alien is intelligent, cunning, and a shape changer who can assume the form and personality of anything it destroys, and soon it is among the men of the expedition, killing and replacing them, using its shape changing ability to lull the scientists one by one, into inattention and destruction. The transformed alien can seemingly pass every effort at detection, and the expedition seems doomed. Okay. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that was an accurate summary of the book? I do. I do. I'll be honest with you. Um, when I first started, thank God it was short, because we know what I'm like when it comes it was, to you. Uh... It, was, it was a novella. It was only 70 pages in length. Yeah, but when I first started reading it, I'll be honest with you, the first chapter, I was like, oh my God, this is so boring. It was very like wordy and technical, but once it kind of got into the the alien actually being there and kind of getting up to mischievous things, then it got more interesting. But I'll be yeah. honest with you, at the start, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to read this. I'm like, this is really boring. But then once that went, I I properly got into it then. The funny thing is this book in many ways, the exposition that you get in the first chapter Mm. reminded me very much of Michael Crichton's original Jurassic Park with Mm. the science Mm. and the scientific explanations that you get as you as the book starts, because obviously it starts with them discovering this creature in ice And they are all, uh, most of the people on the um, expedition are of a mind that, oh no, well, we'll cut it up into pieces and then defrost it because what, uh, because somebody says, oh, well, what if it's alive? Hmm. And you're like, oh, great. And then the red eyes open and the characters aren't really paying that much attention to the fact that all of a sudden this creature is alert. I have to say that I found some of the descriptions of the creature kind of disturbing. Like the what? tentacles growing out of its neck, for example, mm. were um, something out of a nightmare for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's something that they, I mean, obviously we're going to do the film, but it, it's something I think that the um, Carpenter kind of did well with the movie because obviously I'd seen the movie I'd seen half of the movie I had seen it years ago but I couldn't remember it but I'd seen half of it and then when I was reading this I was picturing that so I kind of read this watched a bit of the movie read this watched some more of the movie finished this do you know that way so I was kind of like I had this vision in my head but yeah it's it's terrifying I will say one of the things that I found very um, interesting about Campbell's writing was he was able to describe things without well giving us a lot of detail but at the same time not making it take an incredibly long time because though the first chapter was um very very slow moving it was very scientific it was all about um it was 
all about the exposition expedition and what they were there for and there were a few to and fro conversations about oh well we've discovered this thing it was after the red eyes opened and they noticed certain things happening with the dogs on site and it was very I mean the description about the alien is very good and very accurate in that he was playing this thing was playing the individuals against each other to the point where they were going to self-destruct yeah, I, and I, I must admit that those types of stories, whether it's film or book form, I find them really interesting, fascinating, but also really frustrating because, I mean, obviously the situation that they're in is very different to, you know, everyday life, but it's, you know, another one of those things that it just causes so much disruption between them all in the sense that nobody now trusts each other, you know, every, who could it be? Is it you? Is it because because it takes on the form and then everyone's just constantly wondering like who it is. And you see people kind of almost losing their mind. And there's a lot of arguing and shouting and all this kind of stuff. And it's it's things like this. I kind of sometimes think, can you not just work together? But in situations like this and that we always see people just can't fear, I suppose, plays a big part of that. And like, look where they are. They're in the middle of nowhere in Antarctica. Like, and I, they, you know, it's not exactly um, a time where you could just pick up a mobile phone and call someone to come and help you. So they're just like isolated in this place and everyone's scared. No one's experienced it before and they just don't know what to do. And it just turns into this kind of like, you know, shouting, blaming, it's you, you know, who do we trust? And I find those things fascinating, but also really frustrating at how people, I just feel like going, would you just all calm down? And just have a chat. (laughs) And it is very much, in a way, it is very much like a closed room Agatha Christie mystery Hmm. or Knives Out where they are, who do we trust? It could have been you. You had a motive. You've been acting really weird. You said something to somebody else and you went off on your own for ages. Mm -hmm. And there is all that suspicion. So, I mean, you are right. It was, um, there were no opportunities for mobile phones. And in this instance, they had a plane, but they didn't have helicopters and things like that. And so they were incredibly isolated, but there was also a a certain timelessness to it Mm. because you could see this happening today because if Wi-Fi went out or the electricity cut out or the generator wasn't working or there was a serious storm, they would still have been isolated, stuck in the middle of nowhere. And the the human, the nature of the human being as it is, you'd have still had that suspicion and that lack of trust in a person who previously would have probably been stitching you up or giving you a meal. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of a strange thing to me because when I because especially because of the isolation and you know that, you know, you can run to the next house or the next town or whatever. And it's it's always like baffles me when, you know, I would like to think I would sit down and go, look, we're all scared. Let's come up with a plan. But I, I, I think the timeless thing is right, because, you know, I mean, I've never been to Antarctica, but I presume you know, the Wi-Fi probably isn't as great as it is here. <laughs> like, you know, and the Wi-Fi like, isn't exactly great here all the time either. Yeah, exactly. So, I, you know, I can imagine that being places like that, it is very isolating and, you know, you can't just run away and, you know, because what are you going to run into? A polar bear. Um, but I just, I don't know. I just think it's the perfect kind of location as well. And I know we get this in all types of films and, and books probably. I know you read more than me. But I think when these types of things happen in such an isolated area it makes it better because it has because people don't have that backup of just popping out the door into town run into a police station run in for help you know running to get a phone off someone and that's what I I I love um stories where I know the people are so unbelievably screwed because there's nowhere to go. And I know that probably makes it sound a bit bit messed up, but I do, that's one thing about this uh, book and film that I enjoyed about it, because what what can we do? What are we supposed to do in this situation, you know? I think that's also playing on 
your fears mm. because you are, I mean, as a society is so used to having access to certain things. I mean, we grew up in the 80s and we didn't have the internet. We didn't have mobile phones. Thank God. If, yeah, we didn't have um, rewind and fo- fast forward and pause <laughs> on our TVs. Uh, all of these things that we take for granted now, we didn't have. And if you think about the fact that these people, wherever, whatever time they were, they were living mm. in, the likelihood is a lot of those things that we rely on and they rely on on an everyday basis, they wouldn't have access to as easily. Mm. So they would be calling out for help using whatever method they had. They yeah. would be finding that if they did get access to some, if somebody did respond to their call for help, given the situation they were in, would that be a good thing? Well, I think when I was saying there about, you know, running out to get help and stuff, the irony to that is we live in a world where people aren't as helpful as they, you know, were like, you know, it's not like you would run out into the street and trust the first person you see. You might out of fear, but I think with stories like this, if, you know, certain films like Alien or something are to go by, you kind of think to yourself, if they were to call, you know, the authorities and be this is what's happening, you know the authorities don't care about those people. They, A, would just want to blow the whole thing up and not let anyone know anything ever happened, put it down to some accident, or B, they would want to get the specimen and examine it and kill everyone around it and not care what happened, but as long as they get their prize to see what's going on. So I think you're right in that sense. You can't just because they may potentially get help doesn't mean that they would get the help that they actually wanted because but not only that if they got help are they just bringing more people in to help the to aid the aliens mission in well, exactly. spreading globally rather than it's kind of like um a virus in that if you're at home alone and you've got a virus, you've caught whatever it is, we're not going to mention any names. Um, if you've caught something that is hugely contagious, do you then contact someone and say, hey, I need somebody to go to the chemist. Can you bring this round? And yeah, I'll make you a cup of tea. Or do you figure out another way to do it so you're not passing it on to somebody else? Well, yeah. And that's the situation yeah so we're in at the end of it and I suppose especially because the person that's asking for the help could be the the one could be the do. one who's yeah. impacted and like with us asking for help we would well I would say leave it at the door and go because I don't want you to get this type of thing um but yeah there there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't get help and you might not get the help you know so yeah exactly and I think that he wrote this in such a way that you were not left thinking but you did start to wonder at your own what you would do in that particular situation Mm. he wrote it in such a way that you the characters became kind of friends in a way and you were concerned for them even though at certain points I did find myself thinking okay so which character was that again because there are quite a few characters oh I, ca- I couldn't keep up with <laughs> there was only one I really knew most of the time um and that was Blair the the biologist guy I because his name come up a lot but I, so I actually Conant. sorry and so did Conant yeah so I I mean I actually have which I will do for the film as well. But I've got a list of the names here because that's one thing I actually did think about this. I was like, oh my God, there's so many people. How am I supposed to? But that I, I, that's usually unusual, I find, because sometimes when, well, a lot of times I find, especially in film, you've got these characters, but there's usually only really two or three, four that you have no. to care about. Whereas with all of these, you 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 kind of have to make sure you're aware of all of them and what all of them are doing because it could be any one of them. So it's not like, you know, you see a famous actor and you're like, well, obviously there's something massive to do with this because they're the famous actor, you know, this type of thing. Whereas with this, you're like, I I need to pay attention to all of these characters because it literally could be any one of them. 
And any one of them could be the one that figures it out or survives yes. or yeah. does whatever. I, f I did find myself making mental notes and I read it on my mm. Kindle, which is actually quite a rare thing these days. I did um, <laughs> as anybody will know, seeing my TBR, um, I find that I make I kind of screenshotted. I was highlighting bits as I was reading through it because I, I didn't want to miss anything. But he mm. also used a lot of very descriptive text around the location and the events that were occurring rather than taking the time to define the characters so much. Mm. Which yeah, no. was quite a clever way to actually get you to care about them. Yeah, yeah, you, you did because I don't know. Maybe yeah, you care about them because you don't know <laughs> you don't yeah. know which one. But you which. were also almost sympathising with their situation. Yeah. Oh God, a hundred percent. Because I think like anything, you you put yourself in situations, and when you read stuff or watch stuff, and you're like, what would I do? And I was, you know, doing that. And it's kind of as well, you, you you get in these types of thing, there's always the people are like, just leave it alone. Just leave it be, you know, let's lock it up somewhere. And then you get the other people, oh, let's cut it open. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? What's this goo? Um, you know, it, it's that type of thing. Yeah. And uh, I would definitely be the person, lock it away. Don't anyone touch it. And the people that wanted to, I'd tie them to a chair. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can see why that would. I, I don't think I'd want to examine it too closely. No. Uh, but I don't think I'd have dragged it out of the ice either. No, no, I wouldn't have done um any of that. I just some things just like I'm a curious person, but I'm a curious person from afar. I'm not going to go up and prod the alligator. <laughs> I think the I think that one of the things this book was highlighting was scientists will do anything to further their knowledge yeah and I get like I I think one of the reasons I struggled with the first episode is because science it's not my thing it really isn't and it bores the ever-living life out of me and I, I I'll be honest with you I would love to be one of those people that could sit and read it but I was I actually thought I'm not going to be able to read this because it was, like you said, the first um, chapter was all that kind of talk. And I was just like, nope, this is not up my alley. So it, luckily it, it went into more of my language. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it, it moved on. into the yeah. sort of science fiction action rather yeah. than the science science specifics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good with that. And that's one of the reasons as well I wouldn't go because I'm not curious about... I mean, if someone, like if something was discovered... And others, you know, went rooting around and came back with the information online. Yeah. I might be curious, but I am not going to go in search of that. But I get the whole thing with science and doctors and all that, you know, who are curious because that's their field, that's their passion. So I can see it. But at the same time, if you're going to do it, it needs to be in an extremely safe environment where if anything does go wrong, you know, you're the one that gets it, not everyone else around you. You know, it's quite selfish in a sense. But I suppose they theorized that they were all out there for a very, very similar thing. They were all scientists. Everybody on that yeah. base was um, science focused and they all understood the risks of yeah, being where people, they were. Some people, it's just their job. Other people, it's their passion. Yeah, but would you, you know? want to sign up to a long-term mission somewhere that isolated if it wasn't your passion well yeah because I I know of people who have gone and done things in isolated areas because they don't have to pay any rent they can save all the money they're going to earn and it's a way of six months out here which isn't a big long time at the big scheme of things you know and like if someone said to me you can um go and sit in uh, on an island for six months and just podcast and all that kind of stuff, watch horror films and read true crime and I will pay you for the privilege. I'd be like, nice. You know what I mean? So some people, because it's a way, for me, I would look at it as a way of getting some money behind me because I could save up all my money. And I know people that have done that, whereas others, it would be, I don't think all of them had exactly the same amount of passion 
as everyone because that's impossible. You can't have 20 odd people all like exactly the same in the same place. It, you know, I, I just don't think it would work like that. But yeah. despite all that, you may have a passion for it, but you may have some common sense and think, hang on a second, if we're going to cut this thing open, let's do it somewhere a bit safer than in the middle of Antarctica with no real protection. You know, you can still be curious, but sensible. But then that's self-preservation because hmm. if the suspicion, which they kind of had that they, they did have a suspicion that this creature could potentially, if it were alive, be dangerous, they were in, in a way, in a very opportune location to do that. Because if they'd been in a city, can you imagine what would have happened if they'd been in a highly populated area? No, I get that. But I also feel like in this situation, you'll be the one slicing it open. I'll be the one, Ray, stop it. <laughs> oh, thanks. So I've got the, I'm, I'm the mad scientist. You're okay. the mad scientist in this situation. I'm the one locked inside a chamber going, mm, too bad. <laughs> you know? I don't know if I like that analogy. Well, that's the way you're talking. Yeah, but I get, like, I do get what you mean about, but I feel like if it was in like a, built up area or, or, a, or a lab or a big building you know it, it, they've got underground spaces like I'm sure this kind of stuff is going on in some form somewhere I wouldn't of course it is there's something going I don't mean this alien but you know I don't think we're alone I know your listeners are like oh for god's sake you know I think it's very arrogant to think that in this whole universe we're the only ones going god I yeah, hope but not. I don't think that they come here either no because they're not that stupid <laughs> Exactly. Um, but you know, some of them might be in other in other galaxies, there might be some dumb alien that's like, oh, what's it like down there? Um, but yeah, I uh, I just wouldn't. I I'm too street smart for that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about the writing overall for this book though? Give up disregarding the fact that the first chapter was incredibly scientifically focused. The rest of it was far more action based and yeah, uh, yeah. moving. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think after that first um, uh, chapter, it flowed really well, and I was really engaged, and I wanted to read the next word and see what was going to happen. You know, whereas with the first chapter, I didn't. I was like, I, 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 I. To be honest with you, I couldn't even tell you what happened in the first chapter because I was that bored. Whereas That's the rest. Good. Yeah, exactly. Whereas the rest of it, I really enjoyed. You know, I'm not, um, I'm not fancy when it comes to to reading. I don't like anything over the top. Or I mean, people are probably listening to going, it's not over the top, Lorraine. To me, it is because I don't understand that kind of jargon. I like stuff to be simple, just nicely, nice to read, flows along nicely. Something that I can get my teeth into, which is obviously horror. And uh, yeah, so I enjoyed that. But take the first chapter eight and just be like they're doing some research chapter two <laughs> <laughs> did you know that there was actually a full length extended manuscript published of this book I did not know that Rachel yeah in 2019 the extended manuscript was published under the title which I think is kind of appropriate really frozen hell yeah yeah that that's actually a good uh is it like out there to read or was it like did you I say thought it, it was published so oh, was published. I'm guessing it was it was also published under the title the thing from another world yeah I know I didn't see that but um yeah no I didn't are you going to read the other one no. I don't know because I, I'm I'm one of these people that I like science fiction but I prefer outer space science fiction to um you know traveling in spacecraft and exploring other planets rather than Oh look, something's invading and it's going to take us over. Yeah, no, I don't mind that. I like I like science fiction myself, but I, I like all kinds. So I do like this type of um thing. I you think like because more to me horror, it just, science fiction. Yeah, and, and and I like I like science fiction in general. Um well some of it, not all of it. Um, but I think for me, science fiction isn't real. Like, I don't think that the alien's going to come landing and someone's going to turn into one and all that. You know, that to me, that's not going to happen. Well, no, that's the yeah. whole point of science yeah, fiction. But, but that's that's the point. You you, It's easy 
to watch because like you say how you find certain things hard to watch because they're real whereas this it's just like it can just wash over you because you're like I'm living in a fantasy land here you know yeah so it's you know it's never gonna you, you can read fiction and you know think you know that could happen but this I mean it could happen you never know <laughs> But yeah, just because something's fiction, it doesn't mean, you know, it can't happen. But, you know, this is so far removed. I think if you watch this film and go, oh, God, I'm not going to Antarctica. You never know what you might bump into. Then you might need to get some help. Yeah. You know, but if it was a polar bear going around killing someone, I'd be like, yeah, fair game. I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> that so could happen. separation of reality from fantasy. Or maybe the alien got into a polar bear and it's an alien polar bear. It could be, yeah. So yeah, but um, overall, I, I I enjoyed it. Would you read anything more by this author? Bearing in mind he has he has quite a large back catalogue. I would off of the back of this, I would. So I would. I don't know what else he has. Um. Oh, there's one here. When the atoms failed, 1930. Um. Yeah, I would. But you know me, I'm not great with the sitting down and reading. No, but at the same time, these books aren't, well, these novellas aren't incredibly long. He Oh, no, no. He yeah. tended to write and focus far more, it seems, on the shorter novel or the shorter story. And I'll be honest with you, for me, I prefer that because in general with, um, like, even when I'm reading, like, true crime and stuff like that I'm not a big fan of over the top details like when Deb tells me about Game of Thrones and it takes five pages to describe a piece of beef like do you know what I mean I just I that would bore the ever living hell out of me I don't like I, I, I struggle to write like that like when I would do essays and stuff like that I just can't go into all the detail I find it boring I'm like I'm very much a person let's just get to the point. And I'm like that in all parts of my life. So when I'm reading, you hand me a book this short, I'm like, grand, he's getting to the point. You know, whereas if it's 900 pages, I'm like, no, there's going to be stuff in that that's going to bore the hell out of me. And I can't be arsed with it. You know, so. Yeah, I won't loan you any other books on my bookcase. <laughs> yeah, we're, like we're not doing, is it it? That isn't, is it it that's like a thousand pages? It is, it? I think it is around a thousand, I think about 1100 pages. Yeah, but like, lots of books these days seem to be, they like to call them chunky novels. And I've got a lot of them and there are a lot of them. But then I think that some of the size has to do with the way that it's been bound. Because I'll look at certain books that are 400, 500 pages long and they're thinner than a book than a book that is 360 purely because mm. of the thickness of the paper, the way that it's been bound, the cover and everything else. So it's, it is a lot to do with perception. But Stephen King's, I think his, a, a large number of his 80s novels are incredibly hefty. Yeah. And he seems to be returning to that style of writing again in in the last few years yeah no I and I just I wouldn't have the time I just wouldn't have the time to sit down and um read that much it just wouldn't happen and but to be honest with you I'm happy with how I I do it like I think that's the thing about reading is like I know there's snobs out there and I have no time for them um who judge people on how they read but it's it's a personal thing so if yeah you I agree read, 10 books a month or 50 books a month or one that that's it's no one it's up to you it's what you enjoy you know and that that's the 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 joy of it um is that you can you know do it at your own pace apart from when I have to come onto your show and then I'm like shit better get this done yeah it's one of those things that occasionally you have to suffer through yeah, so I mean, I'm happy to do the short ones and I'll do the longer ones. It's just I need a bit more time. I'd love to do more reading. I just don't have the time to do my podcast. But I suppose I'm reading. I'm just not reading, sitting reading a book. Exactly. You know? But also, if you can, if there are a lot of authors who publish novellas in mm. multiple genres. And a novella mm. is something that you can easily pick up and put down. And as most of them are under 120 pages you still get a full story and it's not 
I don't think there's anything wrong in reading short stories. I'm not a massive fan of them personally, but that is my personal feeling. I think that you read what you want to read. Exactly, exactly. Because, I mean, you're a big reader, but there's sometimes you're texting me going, oh my God, you know, this book is, I can't get into it. I don't want to read it. Like, do you know what I mean? So everyone has their you know what they like and 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 dislike but yeah no I enjoy the short ones because I know I can and as well my memory is is so bad if you give me a short one there's more chance of me remembering it (laughs) exactly well that's it though I mean the fact that you enjoyed this and it's another author that Mm -hmm. you weren't aware of because I mean how many people think oh right well I'm going to look at this obscure author from 1938 not many no I've never heard of him No, to us, he is obscure. I mean, I am, I have no doubt there are hundreds, if not thousands of science fiction readers out there who are going, what do you mean you'd never heard of John W. Campbell? But it's, it's not a genre that I tend to pick up. It's not a genre that you tend to pick up very often. And he had focused intently on writing short stories and novellas that are published that were published in the 1930s in fancy well magazines and things exactly but it's it's impossible to know every author every yeah film. absolutely I mean sometimes I um I was chatting to my friend yesterday and I mentioned Garth Brooks and she says who's Garth Brooks and I was really taken aback by that isn't he she- a country singer yes but I, but but because when I was in Ireland at the time when he was mass, I mean he was like massive, like you know, and I was so I was like really taken aback that she didn't know who he was, you know. Um, but like again, it's she's not into country music, and it's impossible to know everything. So, do you have any final words on who goes there? No, not really. I just glad I read it, and I would recommend um, if any of your listeners haven't, just pick it up and. You know, ignore if you don't like the first chapter, keep going. <laughs> you know, it's like when you watch a TV show, the first episode can be a bit, oh, and then you get in proper, get into it, like, you know. Oh, absolutely. I think for me, it's a, a lot of the time, it's the first season. So, <laughs> yeah, like Mindhunter, the first episode, I was like, I'm not watching this. And I didn't. And I went back to it about two years later. So, you know, it, it's just, um, I've done that with books. I've read the first half of one and then gone back to it. I think one of them I left left for five years and then I went wow. back to it. I reread a few of the earlier chapters and then carried on from where I'd reached. Yeah. And I finished it and I enjoyed it. Unfortunately, that didn't happen with the most recent one I did that with. But yeah, that's another story. <laughs> I don't want to make any more Akatar fans angry. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, and I like we're doing this crossover thing and we're going to do more of those. So uh, yes, I mean, we've absolutely. already got the next month's plan and that book's short as well. Basically, I'm just finding films that have really short books. <laughs> so I can fit them into my schedule and still get my reading well, done. You're, you're, you probably read this in half an hour. <laughs> I, uh, this weekend, to be fair, no. <laughs> it's been a bit of a weekend. Uh, but that was who goes there by john w campbell jr also published under the name don a stewart and you can find the full length novel if it's still available it was published originally in 2019 as frozen hell by john w campbell jr (laughs) i'm gonna now go lorraine where can people find you uh you can find me on instagram and threads as once upon a nightmare uh podcast and you can find me on any platform of choice called Once Upon a Nightmare. And I talk about horror movies and sometimes some true crime. Well, and we are obviously going to be talking about the film that the second film that was inspired by this book, because there were actually three. The first one was public was released in 1951 as The Thing from Another World. And then it was released in 1982 and 2001 the thing (laughs) so we will be talking about the 1982 version in Lorraine's episode of once upon a nightmare next week as you're listening to this and if you want to find me anywhere you can find me on instagram and threads as being bookish pod on x formerly known as twitter as being underscore bookish though that may change very soon 
I'm on TikTok as Being Bookish Reviews. And I ha obviously I have my website where you can find the back catalogue and all of my spoiler free book reviews. And that is beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I really do need to go and read another book at some point because it's sitting there glaring at me. And uh, thank you ever so much, Lorraine, for coming on and talking about this book because I don't think I'd have read it otherwise. But that's a good thing, isn't it? You're getting me to read. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me sound a bit weird. But, um, and you're reading stuff you might not read yourself. You know, exactly. So it's kind of win-win, really, isn't it? It is indeed. Well, thank you very much for coming on. And to everyone out there, as always, farewell. Farewell.